What we're going to cover next, by the way, is um, a strategy for learning vocabulary words and a strategy for reading with comprehension. Um, and you, remember I told you that I learned all this stuff just by muddling through. I know, just, what's going on here? <clears throat> and so what you're about to get is something that um, it really is about muddling through and just discovering and, and then figuring out what has to happen. Um, I think I mentioned some of this yesterday, but let, let me just make sure that I have it all in. Um, my strategy for helping a person, particularly if they're having trouble with reading, is to have them bring something that they are having trouble reading and then bring something that they enjoy reading or that they read and can read and remember. So it may be something about a hobby or a sport or could even be a novel. I don't care what it is. Uh, and then what, basically what I do is um, watch them read. So if I give them a book, let's say, like this, <clears throat> and I'll p uh, pick something that they haven't read before that they don't know. So maybe it's a history book, let's say. And I hand it to them and I say, read this. And here's what you will see them do when you do this with a student. They'll, if I have them read out loud first, which I usually do, they'll read it in a monotone when they're reading their history book. So this is a book about uh, underwater surfing, or no, not surfing, scuba diving. And so it goes like this. It sounds like this. These waves can travel thousands of miles until they finally break in the shallow water of a beach. The size of the wave relates directly to the duration and strength of the wind, causing a strong wind blowing continuously. And it is that kind of monotone, and that bore anybody to death, you know, to have that kind of reading. And then I, if I have them read to themselves um, after a while to see if there's any difference, then what happens is that you watch their eyes, and the eyes will just follow over the words and never stops, never pauses whatsoever. And that's a monotone visual reading, I guess. Now, I then take the book from them, and I say, tell me what you read. Now, remember the eyes over there, the eye access and cues, and then watch me, because this is what you'll see them do. They'll go, well, I don't remember anything. I, I didn't know you were going to ask me that question. And they go look up there, and they frown. And then they look down here, and they go, well, that's something about water. That's about all I can remember. And then they go back down there, and then they go over there to kinesthetic, and they generally feel bad, kind of slump. OK, now that tells me that there aren't any pictures there, because you don't frown if there are good pictures there. Or the pictures that they have are not very clear or, or not good in some way. When they go down in auditory, they usually get some sort of word, isolated, fragmented words, but it has no comprehension at all. So I take that book from them, and I hand them maybe the Sports Illustrated or the book on something that they enjoy, and say, read this. And when they read, um, when they read out loud, it sounds more like this. First of all, by the way, if I hand them something like this, they typically will, will maybe look at it, and then you see them kind of flip the page, maybe look at it. And they don't all do that, but some of them do that. And then when they start um, reading, they go, diving from boats is tremendously popular for many good reasons. Dive boats can often take you to dive sites with the best clarity, the most aquatic life. Is there any difference in that kind of reading and the first kind of reading? I mean, there's much more emphasis, much more getting into it. When you have them read, um, to themselves, their eyes will do one of two things. The eyes will start to go across the page, and then they'll pause, and the pupils will dilate. They'll go across the page a little bit more, they'll stop periodically, and the pupils will dilate. A little bit more, the pupils will dilate. Or they'll do this. They'll just sit back, and they'll dilate their pupils, and, the, and their eyes will go across it, and you'll see them do these little jerks, which is a kinesthetic reaction. Not these, not big jerks like I'm doing, but little tremors, like thing. Take the book from them, say, tell me what you read, and this is typically what they will do. They go, well, this is a book about scuba diving, and how diving from boats is really good because it can take you to places with the best water clarity and everything. <coughs> and so they typically go up visual and stay there. Sometimes they'll drop down into some of the other stuff, but most of it is right up here in visual. Now, I did that with student after student after student after student, and I kept noticing, you know, there's a pattern here. Uh, when they read history books and science books and things like this, they, they do not visualize. They do it auditorily. They sound out the words. They do it monotone. When they read stuff like they like, 
They read it visually, primarily. Duh. <laughs> Maybe there's something going on here. And so I, I just started noticing that, you know, the, and this was kid after kid, you know, different kinds of kids, male, female, it didn't make any difference. They would have this pattern of a different way that they would read. So it got me really interested in why this phenomena occurred. You know, why is it that when they pick up the history book or the, the science book or something like this that they slip into this auditory strategy? Then another phenomena occurred <clears throat> almost the same time. Um, I started running some ads in the paper. I was trying to expand beyond just word of mouth. <clears throat> and I would have parents call and say, maybe you can help me. So my little Susie used to love school so much, and she's just eager to go to school, and now she hates it. And she cries every morning because she has to go to school. And she doesn't like it, and she's not making good grades, and sometimes she gets cries so much she gets sick. Or a little Johnny to make any difference. And I kept getting this same thing over and over again. So I did the good old NLP thing. I go, well, what's, when did you first notice this shifting occurred? And the answer I got was just stunning to me. <clears throat> I would get an answer all the way from fourth to fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. And I go, gee, what's going on in the fourth or fifth grade that's causing kids not to be able to enjoy school anymore? And then I kind of put two together, the fact that they, they visually read the things that they like and they auditorily read the things that they don't like. Then I put together the fact that when they are in the early grades, <clears throat> what kind of books do we give them? Pictures. Books with a lot of pictures in them. And we give them books that have their own sub things that they know about. So they, they have, remember this is subjective experience, so when they're reading about a dog, let's say, dog chasing a cat or something like this, they already have a personal reference experience for dogs. They probably have their own dog. And so when they say the word dog, that hooks a picture of a dog. You know, what does a dog, their dog sound like? What does their dog feel like? What does their dog smell like? Probably even what does their dog taste like? <laughs> or something like um, <clears throat> Now... And think of how we teach kids to read. See, the first three grades, we are learning to read. The fourth grade, this phenomena occurs. We now hand kids a social studies book or a science book and say, okay, read this, have to take a test on it. Now they're supposed to read to learn, but we never teach them how to do that. And that a shift occurs at the fourth grade in, in most kids. Sometimes it doesn't show up in behaviors until the fifth grade or sixth grade or even later because they try. They read it over and over and over and over, but it just doesn't go in. After they've read it five times, they start getting tired of reading, and they kick out, and they say, I don't want to do this anymore. And then they start having behavior problems, and then the parents start putting pressure on them, and then we start being back into this phenomena right there, the patterns of troubled students because what they're doing doesn't work very well and they don't know what to do differently, basically. So putting these two things together, <clears throat> I start, oh, now I understand. We teach them how to read by teaching them how to phonetically sound, not always phonetically, but how to sound out the words. So now they hit the fourth grade and they say, well, I guess I'm supposed to sound out these words, but guess what? Now they're, they're doing words like, um, let's say, constitution or government, or something like this. They have no pictures with it. They have no sounds with it because they don't have any experience of it. They don't have any kinesthetics with it. They don't have any smells with it. They don't have any taste with it. So they sound out the word like they're supposed to, and nothing happens in their brain at all. In form of learning, it doesn't hook anything at all, or there's nothing hooked to it. Now. Let's stop to think about how most people learn definitions. In my experience, I would, I would wager that 99% of the people, the students of the world probably, when they are learning something, they get lured into that auditory track of saying the word, repeating the definition, or reading the definition. They say the word, repeat the definition, or read the definition, over and over and over and over. <clears throat> what does that do in the brain? What does that do as far as subjective experience is concerned? 
when you're just sitting there reading the definition over and over and over again? Are you creating any pictures? Are you creating any sound? Yeah, you have a whole pile of words there. Are you creating any kinesthetics? Well, it's boring and tired. Are you creating any smell or taste? No, you don't have anything there. So what happens as the fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade, as they start adding this terminology, they are, they are building um, you know, almost like a vacuum of words that have any meanings assigned to them in real life experience. So as they get older and older and further along in school, they experience this phenomenon of reading something, not knowing what they read, reading it again, still not knowing what they read, reading it again, still not knowing what they read. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> Primarily because of the way that they learn vocabulary words, <clears throat> and then primarily because we have not ever got around to teaching them how to read something and to remember what they read. So you're going to get these two things, one right after the other. First, I'm going to teach you a strategy for learning vocabulary. I had to invent this strategy. I had to design this strategy in order to get it to do what I wanted it to do. If, um, if when, when they say the word constitution, according to my old mentor, John Grinder, uh, if you have, um, if you can put information in two of the five senses, then it's going to generalize to the other senses, is what he told me, and I believe that. Since most of them have this visual proclivity, as it is, anyway, I said, well, why not create some images here for the word constitution? Now, if you want to create the sounds of senators in oratory or something like this, that's okay, too. If you want to have some feelings about constitution, Constitution. That's okay too. If you want some smell and taste, that's okay too. But we got to at least have this there. All right. So the vocabulary strategy was designed to supplement, if you will, or, or to go along with the reading strategy that they already had that works when they read something that they enjoy. I don't need to reinvent that. I just need to help them transfer that over to the academic scene and then maybe spice it up a little so that they can remember data and facts and figures and things like that. So the vocabulary strategy turns out like this. First thing you've got to do because you're playing a school game is you've got to read the definition. What I mean by a school game is some teachers want you to give the definition back to them verbatim, kind of like what Anwar was talking about before. Some do. Yeah, makes me nuts too. So you got to know what the definition is that the schools are expecting you to learn, basically, or you can't play the school game. It may not do anything for the learning experience, but if you want to get along in school, you got to do it like the teachers ask you to do. If you're like, lucky enough to have a teacher say, just get close, then that's wonderful, but you can't always expect that. Now, after you have read the definition, what I want you to do is to picture or image the meaning. Of the definition. What would that definition look like if you translated the words into some sort of pictures or images in your mind? Okay. At this point, when I'm teaching it to somebody, um, I stop and I do the little horse thing. Because with, um, with most of my students, they, they're of all ages. And so once upon a time, I said, I've got to find a definition you know, that would work to be an example of what I mean by, by translate the, or overlap the words into a picture. So I came up with this definition for a ho horse. Excuse me. There's, there are many definitions of a horse uh, in the dictionary. And for those of you that don't have horses in your other countries, don't, don't use my picture of a horse because it, it's, it's unrealistic. But. So I looked up this definition. I said, man, this will work with young kids. It'll work with old kids, and it's just, just to make a teaching point. And the definition goes like this. A horse is a large four-legged animal with hooves that we use to ride and pull wagons. Now, how can you make a picture out of that? Well, my picture, <laughs> and don't you laugh, my, my picture looks something like this. Yours will be better than this. So it's a large, four-legged animal with hooves, 
I'll put a head and a tail on it that we use to ride and to pull wagons. Now what it is, it's important that you have all the little all the little parts of the definition in there so that when you look at that picture, these things will remind you to mention hooves. Or you'll be sure to mention legs. Now adding the the head and the, and adding the head and the tail, you know, probably not going to mess up the definition if you say that it has a, a head and a tail. Now, once you've done that, once you once you in your mind you have an image of the meaning of the word, then what I want you to do next, and this is the retrieval system we're setting up now, what I want you to do next is insert the word in the picture. The word that you are defining. So that the sight of the word and or the sound of the word will pull that picture up. Because you want them to be there simultaneously. So I might do it here. I could do it under the horse. It doesn't make any difference. The next step is, the fourth step, is while, while, the key word, while, looking at the image in your mind's eye, you go, that's a horse. It's a large four-legged animal with hooves that we use to ride and pull wagons. And you say that while you're looking at that picture, which neurologically hooks the sound to the image that you have created. Okay? So that the sight of the word or the sound of the word will kick that image up in your mind. So while looking at image, say the word, and describe the picture. Don't try to remember the, the definition, just describe what you see. That's all you need to do. Now how many of you, just based upon the patterns of the learning strategies that you've seen today, could tell me what the fifth step is? Hmm? It's long-term memory, so you practice. Step four, what, over time. And I would suggest that you, you can practice it six to eight times if you want to, but with uh, this thing, probably three to four times is enough to do it because you have some reality there. It's not just words. It's something that's a, that's a little bit more interesting, a little bit more real life. <clears throat> so, um, it would seem to me that if I'm teaching teachers um, how to, oh, I'm sorry. It seems to me, if, it seems to me if I'm teaching teachers how to teach vocabulary well, I would want them to learn how, <laughs> instead of just hand them a book and tell the kids to do it, we want them, if you're introducing new vocabulary, to do it in a way that's dynamic enough. Sure. And the kids are going to develop that kind of a VAK response anyway. Right. I mean, the whole thing here is that we've, if we're going to teach, if teachers are going to teach any subject matter, I'm suggesting that you teach them how to learn the subject matter before you teach them the subject matter. Right. So you teach them the learning strategies. So any more, like I started off with y'all on Sunday, I said, this is the learning strategy that I want you to use in this course when I do my... NLP certification courses. That's the same way. I start, I start off by teaching them how to learn NLP. From your experience, the students that are good students, so probably the visualizing and they do it naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because they were born like that or, or they got the opportunity to learn it somehow when they were younger. I mean, is it something natural, or it has to be to learning? I don't know. Uh, I think it can be learned, first of all. I think some of them are just lucky. You know, some of them just kind of fell into it, lucked into it. Some of them have had parents that provide them a lot of visual experiences, and so they just, you know, figured it out. But the vast majority of the kids, because, of, in my opinion, because of the school experience, they get lured in or seduced into the auditory thing of trying to memorize stuff. You see, when I was a kid, my mother used to tell us movies with breakfast. 
and this was the closest that we can could go to see mo to see sure. movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm very visual, so learning from the book, it came to me that somehow I was right. learning to do it. Yeah. And say, I, I'm old enough that I I <laughs> I was born before TV, and so for watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what I had what I had to do is I listened to old, old radio programs like The Shadow and Fibber McGee and Molly and stuff like this. Is I would make visual a uh, picture make that's redundant. I would make vivid <laughs> vivid images in my mind that the sound effects were designed to elicit. So we'd sit there and do it. Kids of today don't have to do that because they watch TV, they watch movies, they watch computer screens, they watch videos, they, all sorts of things. The pictures are given to them. And nobody goes to the classroom and says, OK, we're not going to give you pictures anymore. You've got to make up your own. <coughs> I mean, to me, it is a, it is a major, major revelation for, for many of the kids that I see when I say, you mean that's all there is to it? I just got to image this stuff? A lot of people that go through this course, by the time they get through with it, they say, this seems too simple to be so powerful. I mean, it seems it's too easy of an answer that the kids are just simply being auditory when we could teach them to be visual. But that, you know, I'm not, I could try to make it harder, I guess. <laughs> you know, but as far as I'm concerned, this is about as simple as it can be. And it's, it, it's that easy to do. It's that easy to teach. And that's one of the things that makes it so profound. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, what if you have a word that's sort of not existing like the, the definition of a definition? Now you're about to get to practice doing that. So if, if you have a word that is um, more exotic or more abstract or something like this, it's okay to have an abstract picture. I mean, that's that's the nature of the word. So I, I mean, you can go with metaphors. You can go with all sorts of things. It's like, what is the meaning of the word to you? And what when you read the word or hear the word, what kind of internal experience do you want to happen? And then create a picture that would represent that is a good way to do it. So in other words, it would make more sense to teach vocabulary in context for people as opposed to just giving people words and say, find out what they mean. Well, it's, it's, well, new vocabulary is usually presented in context. In other words, you take a science book and you'll be reading along and they'll have a word in bold and then they'll give you the definition of it. So it's there in that whole paragraph. But yet, if the, if the kids don't have a way to learn that definition, it just kind of goes right over their head. Okay. Or, you know, <clears throat> other ways, like in English and things like this, they'll give them a set of words. Like a lot of time, the 20 spelling words that they are given, they have a little definition by them. And so the teacher will say, okay, I want you to learn these spelling words and learn, and write, learn the definitions too. Do you have... Many, many teachers, I, I sometimes have kids say this to me. I'm really good at vocabulary. I make straight A's in vocabulary, and yet I know they can't read. And so I say, well, what do you do that, that you make? How do you get graded? What, you, what do you do that you make straight A's? And they say, well, the teacher gives us this list of words and definitions, and she has it, so if we copy it off and give it back to her, then we get graded, we get an A. But do you think that's doing anything in here? Not at all. Yes. Uh, when you image the meaning of the definition, are there advantages to drawing it out or to do it in your mind? The only time I <clears throat> the question is, uh, is there advantage to drawing it out? Only time I will have a child draw out some definitions is just to get them into the practice or the make a, you know, where they know what I'm talking about. But drawing it out slows them down way big time. So we don't want them to, you know, to do that. Because th if they're drawing it out, the only thing you're trying to do is make the connection, hey, you already got the image in there, so that's where we want it. There's no need to draw it out on a piece of paper if you already got it in there. And if they didn't have it in there, they couldn't draw it out. Now, another little trick that I use sometimes with groups of students, um, <clears throat> I'll have them get together and get a definition and let them brainstorm. You know, what would the image of that look like? Just so that they can kind of have a cooperative learning experience and, and hear how other kids do things because they learn from each other like that. And that is a good way to kind of get them into the deal. Okay, any other questions about it? Any questions about this at all? 
Okay? I think it's on page 17 of your manual. You got those six words that you learned to spell? Same, same process. You don't have to get with the same person, but I want you to get with another person. The first, first three, one of you learned the definitions using this strategy. You teach it to the other person. Get them to go through the strategy. And then you reverse the roles for the last three of those six words. Shouldn't take you very long. Let's say, and then you test each other, by the way. Let's say, um, I'll give you 15 minutes to do it. So before we go on to um, the reading comprehension strategy, let's see if there's any lingering questions about how to do the vocabulary strategy or why it works or any of that type of stuff. Anybody, would it work okay with you? Could you remember what the definitions that you learned? Um, I, I did, and um, I'm not sure that I remember the, I mean, I know what, I knew what they so meant, but the verbatim is the part that is another story. You don't know if you know them verbatim? Right. Well, basically, you keep, if you need them verbatim, you keep practicing until you get them yeah, verbatim. Okay. Right. But you do it off the picture, so. If, if you notice that you're miss, missing something in the picture that you're, uh, or you're missing, you're missing something in the definition, then put it in the picture so that you'll make sure that you, you have it. To get it from right. Okay. Right. What is it exactly? Word by word, word for word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one other thing that um, <clears throat> to me is really kind of interesting, um, I should have written this out so it would save some time. In fact, you write this out. Get you, a, get you a piece of paper and it'll save me writing it out. Get a piece of paper and a pen. I'm going to teach you a little bit of geometry. Oh, no. No, math. Maybe we'll know it. Geometry. <laughs> <laughs> <So, so, laughs> right. Now, there's a. I'm not real sure if it's a postulate or axiom, but and I think I actually put this one in my book, but. Um, I want you to write this out. There's a, let's say, postulate six in, in plain geometry says the following. So write it down. Postulate. P-O-S-T-U-L-A-T-E. It's, it's one of the laws of geometry. So this is postulates, P-O-S-T-U-L-A-T-E. Postulate. Six. It's going to be really hard for me to get this out. Maybe my tongue is not working very well today. Okay, it says this. When two parallel lines, write that down. When two parallel lines are cut by another line, the opposite interior angles are equal. The opposite interior angles are equal. <coughs> now, I give you um, one minute to memorize that. <coughs> word by word? Yeah. Now, you said one piece of interior lines are equal or better than uh, angles? No, angles. angles. Okay. Alternate interior or opposite interior angles are equal. All right, now, <clears throat> what most students do when the teacher, math teacher says, you know, memorize that, is they slip right into this auditory strategy of sounding it out over and over again. And what they have is a bunch of words in their brain, and they don't have anything. Ge plain geometry should be very visual. So here's what I want them to do. Now, 
Describe that picture to me. Yeah, see, because besides the fact that they're interior means they're inside the parallel lines, the fact they're on the opposite sides of the line means they're opposite. Now, which is the easiest to remember this picture and then just describe it or to remember those words that you wrote down? Yeah, makes a lot, heck of a lot of difference. How long does that take you to write the words? Right. <laughs> How long does it take you to write the picture? Yeah. And they give you the picture in the book. Okay, I have a yeah but. Okay. You have a yeah but? Man, you haven't given me a yeah but in a while. You mean this is this is easy? Nuclear physics. Yeah. And that's where my concern lies. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, why not? So what you're concerned about is that when we like higher level, grade thirteen, yeah. like, uh, when you know the nuclear fission and there's this and that I'm how am I gonna how do I I mean I'm assuming that I do the same thing, but I'm gonna have a more complex picture perhaps of movement in order to explain it. Sophisticated um, scientific terminology. Well, when you're learning sophisticated material, your pictures are going to get more sophisticated, right. okay. more complex. They're going to have more in them. But, but if you learn the basic stuff leading up to that, it's just you're just building on it. Right. If you try to jump in to get a PhD in nuclear physics without having the underlying courses, you're going to be lost. <laughs> in fact, I have an interesting story about the vocabulary strategy. <clears throat> um, had a woman about 35 years of age that came to see me and, and uh, she was going back to college. She had, she had a Master of Business Administration and she had owned her own business for probably about 12 years or something like that and was very successful. She had decided that she wanted to be a youth minister. So she went back to school and because she had a master's degree they put her into it at the graduate level in order so, so she could get her doctorate. She struggled and struggled and struggled and, and couldn't read the stuff. And she said, man, I read this stuff all night long and I just don't get it. I don't understand. Maybe I'm getting old or something like this. And so I sat there and I did the, the assessment of her. And what happened was that she had no terminology for it. I mean, she did not have a visual terminology for the, theological things. So she would read, um, read the book and nothing would happen in her brain. I mean, it's that, it's that constitution thing that I showed you a while ago. And when I suggested to her that she uh, uh, needs to kind of stop, maybe drop out a semester and catch up on the terminology that the undergraduates and the other students had, she didn't want to do that because she didn't want to waste. So she wasted the time. So she you know, just, I don't know what ever happened to her after that, uh, but she decided to push on through. And she was working 10 to 15 times harder than anybody else. I mean, poor soul. Other, other stories like that, when people go back to, um, either go back to school or maybe they're changing professions or maybe they want to upgrade their licensure or something like this. Like the one that you're going to have in the morning I'm going to do an assessment and work with is a woman that is a wonderful insurance agent and they're asking her to, to be a financial planner. And like I told you, she's flunked the test twice. I wouldn't be willing to bet you that when she comes in here and I start doing the assessment and we start getting into terminology, that what she's doing is jumping right into taking the sample test and she's not learning the terminology first. So she reads the test question and nothing happens up here. I mean, it, it just it happens like that over and over and over again. So what I do is take them to the glossary and say, you know, what is a, an open-ended mutual fund? I mean, they'll have an open-ended mutual fund. I say, well, what's a fund first? And so they have to go look up what a fund is. Then they have to look up what a mutual fund is. And then what is an open-ended mutual fund? And they build pictures inside their mind that to, to handle the added complexity. And in every case where I've taken somebody that had that, they're trying to cross over and, and do some, you know, a different profession or something like this, their story is they flunked it two or three times. And they come to see me, and usually in one or two sessions, I teach them about terminology and about visual reading. And they go back and take the test after they've applied that, and they pass. I mean, it's just that easy to do. 
Yes. Same, same question is from a student in the sixth grade that says, yeah, this is difficult. You know, but I said, well, when you were a first grader, dog was di as difficult comparing to your age. And you learned it. So now you can do it again. One of the things that I do when, when students talk about how something is going to be difficult or uh, it's going to take a lot of time or it's going to take practice or something like this, I take them right back to their roots and I, I go to metaphorical on them. I say, well, you know, if their mother or father's there, I ask the father, I say, when did they learn to walk? And, you know, they say, well, nine months, a year, whatever time it was. And I say, you know, do you remember learning to walk? And of course, most of them don't. And I say, well, I got these little grandkids, you know, they're just learning to walk and they do these real interesting things. You know, they'll, they'll stand there and hang on to the side of the chair or something like this and you'll see them doing like this, you know, weaving. And everybody thinks they're unsteady, but I think they're learning. They're learning that whenever they lean back like this, the foot comes up. You know, and they're learning those little micro muscle movements that make the body move. And you know, those little kids learn to take those steps and they fall down. And then they get up. Do you think they quit? Do you think they say, man, this is going to take too long. I don't want to do this. <laughs> and aren't you glad that little kid in you had the wisdom to persist, to keep doing it, because he knew the, what the rewards would be? Is that little kid smarter than you now or not? Of course, nobody wants to admit that little kid's smarter, right? And so what that kid knew was persistence and dedication and, yeah, I want to do this. And that's what you need to do because you want to be the kind of student that everybody knows that you can be. And steps. what? And steps instead of leaps. You know, take right. the steps. Right. Because I think often people want to um, get there immediately. Right. Without so patience is one of the things that the little kid had, you know, when he's learning to walk. I just recently got a paper from a university, and it was a linguistics paper, and I haven't done linguistics. And I had exactly what you were talking about, and I, I tossed the paper in. Because there was no glossary. There was no yeah. way to learn the terms, and I thought, I just don't want this. Yeah. Uh, what Linda and I have found when we get out into uh, corporations and teach them how to learn, it's the terminology that is the big downer. I mean. Think of what causes the Peter principle, you know, that you rise to the, your level of incompetence. incompetence. And what we don't do is when we realize that they've hit their level of incompetence, we don't say, okay, it's time to upgrade their learning strategy so that they can learn what to do. We say, get out of here, you know, you're not any good. I've had uh, companies send employees to me that they want to put on a fast rise. They think they're really bright, but maybe they had a dyslexia or ADD in school and they're not real sure they can cut it. And so they'll send them to me, I'll do an assessment, and say, well, what they need to do is learn how to learn. And once we've taught them how to learn, then the company's willing to put them on the fast track and, and promote them. Um, I have a friend that's uh, 40 years old. Now he's 42. And um, he sold computers. And all of a sudden, I mean, he was good. He made money, you know, everything was, but he was burning out on it. And he decided to get out of that field and go into another field. And we said, why? He said, man, I can't keep up anymore. It's changing so fast in the computer field, and I just can't learn as fast as I used to. And I just real quick said, how do you attempt to learn the new terminology? Guess what he did? That verbatim sounded over and over again. And I wish I had got to him before he had resigned his job, because it's two years later, and he still doesn't have a job, by the way. Yes? I was just going to comment, I was going to comment earlier when you started on this um, thing of thought uh, that there are those of us in here who have never have not had an NLP training and a lot of the terminology is brand new to us, so we feel that. <laughs> you get a first-hand experience, right? Exactly. Thank you for that reminder that I need to clean it up. <laughs> or a glossary. <laughs> or a glossary, right. Actually, I have a book that does have a glossary. I'll bring it tomorrow and let you, let you take a look at it. So, see, when Linda, Linda's corporation decided it's named, it's named Corkin, they manufacture pumps and, and um, stuff like that for volatile gases. Um, and they decided to have a Corkin University. And they, as they were describing what they were going to do, it's a wonderful idea. They wanted the, the accounting department to go in and teach the shipping department about accounting. They wanted the shipping department to teach the sales department about shipping and all that so that they could, you know, cross-educate. And as I listened to all these plans come up, I said, you're going to run into terminology if you don't teach them a way to learn terminology. Because when Linda starts talking to me about what she does on the job, accounting stuff, my, my eyes glaze over. 
I mean, literally just glaze over and that doesn't go through at all. And I've developed this wonderful little strategy for listening. <laughs> because, because most of the time she just needs to vent anyway. She doesn't care if, if I have an opinion about it. Sometimes I'll say, am I here just to listen or do you want some feedback on this or want some advice on this or something like that? So there's, there's as far as I'm concerned, the terminology trap is what I call it. It's widespread, it's deep, and it's very severe as far as the emotional um, vitality of our workforce, of, the, of their kids in school of people that are trying to get another job. I mean, it is, it just, it, it goes to the core of what's troubling us. This is why kids get out of school and can't read. This is why they get out of school and they, they have trouble with promotions. They have trouble, you know, ruv- moving rapidly through the company because our information age is becoming faster and faster and faster and we're pushing it down further and further and we're not updating our strategies to let people assimilate that knowledge and assimilate that, those skills. And it's going to catch us if it hadn't already caught us. So I need you guys to go out there and not only work with students and kids, but jump out into corporate America and corporate world wherever you are because there's a vast need there, vast need for knowing how to learn. It's interesting to think about the yeah. short form of what we're saying, that life is meaningless. <laughs> all these terms mean nothing. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. So let's move on and learn the